Hello, everybody. We're back. Uh, we're back for day two of API Days on the main track. And we'll continue our track on microservices, API service meshes, and API specifications. And now we're really glad to receive one of the top entrepreneur and thought leaders of the space, Marco Palladino, CTO and co-founder of Kong, you know, the successful open source API management gateway uh, with enterprise, uh, of course, offers. And uh, he will share with us a topic that a lot of people want to hear about, about service meshes. And this talk is entitled uh, Application Connectivity, Leveraging Service Mesh to Build Modern Applications. So Marco, we're really glad to have you, uh, where you are one of the top CTO of the industry and glad to hear your talk. The stage is yours uh, right now. Enjoy the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mehdi. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Marco Palladino. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Kong. And today, really, we're going to be looking at one of the most important things that is enabling modern applications and modern architectures, and that is application connectivity. As you know, we are entering, and we have entered since a few years now, a new era of software. We're transitioning away from monolithic applications to microservices. And as we're making that transition, we're really transitioning away from large code bases into decoupled, distributed, services. The biggest difference that this transition brings is replacing the reliability of the CPU where everything runs on top of one monolith, on top of our virtual machine, for example, if it's a Java application. And we're replacing all of that with service connectivity and service connections that are linking all of our services together. And you know, really, um, one of the reasons why we're doing this transformation. You know, sometimes it's it's easy to get too deep into the transformation without taking a step back and realize why we're doing all of this. And really, what what we're seeing is that, uh, as we all know, every business is becoming a digital business. And and of course, when, once they become digital, we want to be able to attract new customers. We want to be able to enter new markets. We want to be able to create more reliable applications. To do that. We use cloud vendors. Uh, we replicate our systems in different data centers for high av availability. And we fundamentally introduce more and more connections with the goal of making our software more reliable and to grow our business in a faster way. As we make this transition, we are transitioning away from centralized architectures that are monolithic, they're static, they don't change much when it comes to the deployment. You know, we, we redeploy the entire thing every time, uh, the monolith component. Um, you know, for some enterprise organizations that has been primarily on-premise, so some enterprise orgs are transitioning to the cloud as they're transitioning to microservices. And we're, and we're moving towards a decentralized world where we can scale our teams in a much faster and better way because each one of them doesn't have to eat this big chunk of code, but they can work on decoupled services. They can iterate much faster. They can deploy much faster. They can deploy every day in order to be able to create a more reliable application. Now, of course, on one end, the benefits of transitioning to a decentralized architecture is that we can do all of these things, right? So smaller components being deployed faster, being deployed in a distributed way. But on the other hand, we introduce a few problems that we didn't have before. And that is the control and the visibility and perhaps even the security that we're now, if we don't do anything about it, we're now losing over time. You see, transitioning from centralized architectures to decentralized architectures, it's something that um, introduces the network as one of the main points that we have to take care of in order to be successful with this transformation. And the more services we have, the more network connectivity we have. And that is the good and the bad of our of this new uh, way of building software. Because the network by default, if you don't do anything about it, it's not secure. The network can be slow. The network can be unpredictable. The network, as we do much more back and forth across our services, we need to be able to log and monitor and trace all that our services are doing within the network. Now, uh, you know, when we're transitioning from, when we're building a monolithic application, fundamentally we had different objects. So let's say we're building a marketplace. We're going to be having users. We're going to be having uh, items that we can search for. We're going to be having all these different objects that fundamentally 
they're being described within the monolith, within different objects, different classes that we're building. And the way we communicate, um, the way we make these different objects talk to each other is via an interface. This is your typical monolithic application. Now, as we decouple our monolithic microservices, the interface, it's still there, but becomes an interface over the network. So we are replacing those local function calls, if you wish, with network calls among different services. We are going to be having services that can be large or small, you know, with whatever size we need them to be, and are going to be talking with each other via an API. The network, it's something that we always had, of course. You know, even when a monolith was talking to a database, that request was going over the network. What is changing between back then and now is that we have much more, many more services, and therefore the network becomes uh, a problem that compounds over time if we don't do anything about it. The network requires a few things that we need to build that we didn't really have to build when our objects were communicating with each other within our monolith. We need to make sure that the network is secure. We want to be able to assign an identity to every workload that runs on the network. We want to be able to encrypt that traffic communication. We want to implement zero trust security models. Uh, we want to be able to determine what services can consume other services. We want to be able to route across different versions of our services. We want to be able to implement canary releases and can canary deployments. We want to be able to uh, observe and log and trace everything that's happening in the network. You see, in a, in a monolithic application, if there is a problem, we, we get a stack trace. And the stack trace tells us exactly where the problem was. As we transition to microservices, that's not the case anymore. Uh, we, we, are, we have a stack trace for the individual service, but if something goes wrong in that service connection from one service to another, we don't really know where it went wrong unless we have observability in place. We want to be able to harden our systems. And so we may introduce new patterns like chaos engineering, for example. These are all concerns that we, we have every time we make any request over the network. Now, you know, if you look at this from a, or organically, you know, from a, from a very simple standpoint, we may think, fine, you know, we have to make a request over the network. So the application that I'm building, in this case, the monolith, is going to also create functions and, and business logic to handle that network. So we're going to be doing error management. We're going to be doing retries. We're going to be doing um, security handling and enforcing. We're going to be doing all sorts of things as part of our smart client, if you wish, uh, when it makes a request outside the monolith, outside the context of the monolith to another service. The problem with this, uh, as we you know, uh, you know, scale the organization, as we have multiple teams building software, is that different teams are going to be using different technologies, different programming languages, different frameworks, and they're going, they're going to be creating this library in different languages in a very inconsistent way, in a very fragmented way. This is a problem that even with monolithic applications we have. So this is not something that necessarily microservices introduce. Microservices, they in increase the scale. So what microservices do is they take a small problem and they make it much bigger because we have many more services. And if we have fragmentation, uh, we, have, we have much more of that happening across the board. So for example, uh, I was working with a, with a customer, um, a very large global bank. They needed to upgrade their mutual TLS across the organization, but they couldn't. They couldn't because the teams were in charge of building these smart clients um, in a different way. Each one, each one of them built it in a different way. And when, it, when the time came, to upgrade the mutual TLS across the organization because one of the previous TLS protocols was faulty, the organization couldn't just do it. They had to go chase down every team who built each one of these services, each one of these client libraries and tell them to write more code or fix it to upgrade it. The problem is, as we transition to microservices, we do not want the application teams to manage the network. We want to abstract the network the same way uh, Kubernetes, for example, abstracts the data center. We don't want them to deal directly with the network and secure it and manage it by themselves. Because when they introduce fragmentation and poor implementations into managing all this service connectivity, guess what happens? We create unreliable applications. And unreliable applications are not good for business. 
ultimately, if we reconnect all of this to the primary goal, which is we want an organization that goes faster, that creates more reliable software, that can attract more customers, that can make existing customers happier. As we go to this transformation, if we do not change how we manage the network within our systems, then the application teams will do it. But the goal of the application teams is to build the application, not to manage the network. Therefore, therefore we're going to be having an inconsistent way of dealing with that service connectivity, which in turn will create unreliability. So what if we instead took a different approach? What if the code that we're writing for managing all of those requests that our services or even monoliths are making to any other service, uh, what if we extract it and we put it into into a separate executable, into something else that because it's a separate executable, we can now carry over across every programming language and every uh, uh, framework because it's an out of process. It's a, it's a separate process, separate executable. It's an out of process um, you know, implementation. So now if we did that, we could be using this in order to be able to make requests, outbound requests to any other service. And we could write it once and carry it and carry it over across all the teams and all the applications that we're building. Now, of course, this is only worth it if the latency that this out of process hopping the network is doing is very uh, low. So in order to be able to remove the latency for as much as possible, we want to be able to run our executable that manages all these outbound requests uh, we want to be able to run it on the same underlying host or virtual machine or pod as a sidecar container to make sure that the communication between the service and these separate executable is always on local host. Therefore, we want to reduce the latency as much as we can. Of course, the latency is always going to be higher than an in-process network management, but the goal here is to remove fragmentation. So if these our separate executable in this case provides so many benefits, that overpower the small increase of latency that we're doing on localhost, then it's worth it. Now, the nice thing about this is that if we only have it on, um, you know, if we only deploy this library for outbound requests, we can only do some things, but not some other things. For example, one of the things we want to implement is implementing end to end mutual TLS. In order to implement end to end mutual TLS, we would like to have this library running on every other service on localhost in order to be able to be enforcing this end-to-end -end connectivity uh, in a secure way without having to re-implement it in our services. So effectively, if we deploy these separate executable next to our services uh, and the separate executables are the contact points every time there is a service wanting to consume another service, now this executable can enforce mutual TLS, can enforce end-to-end -end tracing and so on and so forth. Now there is a good news about all of this. And the good news is we don't have to build our own executable, but the industry provides us with open source options that we can adopt um, you know, uh, without having to build it ourselves. And so one of them is, for example, Envoy Proxy. Envoy Proxy is a very lightweight proxy um, that provides a very nice API for dynamic reconfiguration of the policies you want to apply over the network. And we can use Envoy um, as uh, you know, next to our applications and next to our services in order to be able to manage this, fun net this network connectivity. Of course, if you look at the big picture, Envoy in this case will be running alongside every service that we want to manage. Now, what if we want to change the configuration of some of the behaviors that Envoy is enforcing? We don't want to redeploy every time, for example, if, if we want to update mutual TLS or we want to implement a routing strategy, we don't want to redeploy a new configuration to Envoy. We want to be able to dynamically reconfigure Envoy without having to trigger a new redeployment of the entire thing. Um, and so Envoy supports the concept of uh, introducing um, a dependency uh, that's called the control plane, which is the source of truth for all of this configuration. And if we do use a control plane, the control plane is in charge of accepting our configuration and then pushing it to the Envoy proxies. So the control plane becomes the source of truth of all the service connectivity policies that we want to apply. And the control plane is in charge of now pushing that configuration uh, or making that configuration available to Envoy proxies uh, in order to be able to enforce policies on the service to service request. In this 
example, that source of truth is the control plane because it, it, it's the service that we are using to control everything else. And Envoy becomes uh, sits on the data plane, on the execution path of the API of the service-to-service -service requests. The control plane is never on the execution path of the service-to-service -service requests, which means that technically we could be lose connectivity to the control plane, but the service-to-service -service requests will not stop working. Now, if you look at this picture, this is service mesh. Service mesh is not a new thing. Service mesh, it's a bad, better implementation of something that our teams have been doing up until now, which is managing the network. And we want them to stop doing that moving forward because as we move to microservices as part of our decentralization transformation, the, the fragmentation that they introduce in managing the network gets bigger and bigger, which ultimately will cause unreliability in our systems. So instead of managing the network, um, you know, instead of allowing the teams to manage the network, what if we tell them, listen, stop managing the network, deploy these uh, separate executables, which is can be Envoy proxy, uh, run it alongside your services, regardless on what programming language, what, you know, the, and, it's, and the services, by the way, can be services that the application teams are creating, but also services that we're deploying ourselves, but we're not building ourselves. For example, we can deploy um, a data plane like Envoy next to a database like MongoDB or Redis or, you know, Oracle, you know, anything really. Anything that makes requests over the network will have these data plane proxy alongside it. And the data plane proxy is in charge of intercepting outbound requests so that we can apply network policies and also receiving inbound requests on, on, the, on the receiving end of, the, of our service-to-service -service connectivity in order to be able to enforce end-to-end um, -end encryption and tracing and mutual TLS and so on. Of course, if you have many many of these proxies, we want to be able to have a, an easier way, a scalable way to configure them. And, uh, and we introduce the concept of a control plane. And, uh, and this is service mesh. Service mesh is the combination of these data planes and a control plane that allows them, that allows us to configure them. Of course, uh, at Kong, you know, we're working very deeply with these sort of use cases uh, in the community and in the enterprise. So we did um, an, a release, uh, a project called Kuma, which is a control plane uh, built on top of Envoy that supports Envoy as a data plane proxy that it's quite simple, it's quite portable um, and very simple and easy to use really. Uh, as a matter of fact, we just announced yesterday the donation of Kuma in the, in the CNCF landscape. So you can use Kuma in order to uh, deploy a service mesh with an open uh, and neutral uh, con uh, control plane um, within your systems. Uh, Kuma, it's quite simple to use. Uh, service mesh has been quite hard for many users and many customers of ours, and so we wanted to simplify it. Kuma is a very simple project. Um, it's a turnkey. It's a turnkey service mesh. We don't have to build an R and D team on top of Kuma to manage Kuma. It just comes out of the box. It's open source. It's neutral. It's part of the CNCF um, landscape as a sandbox project for now. And um, and you know, on Kuma.io, you'll have the chance to get up and running with it. Quite simple. This is what service mesh is. I'm demystifying service mesh in my presentation today. Um, and of course, you know, uh, the network traffic that we're processing will, will increase over time. And as we're making that transition from monolith to services to microservices, uh, service mesh really is the end goal of our transformation, where the application teams focus are focused on building the applications and we, the architects, take control of that service connectivity and we control it in a centralized way via the control plane, but then we execute it in a decentralized way on the data plane process. Um, I'm going to wrap up. This is my, almost at the end of my presentation. You know, some folks ask me, you know, what's the difference between a gateway and a service mesh? Well, so the gateway really, you know, when we think of a service mesh, we're looking at uh, the low level traffic that our applications are doing to their dependencies. So in an enterprise organization, usually it's very hard to have one service mesh for the entire org uh, because we want to, to introduce more isolation between the teams and the applications. We don't want them to depend on the same mesh. And so usually what we're seeing working in production uh, is a service mesh being adopted within the application for all the dependencies that the application is consuming. And then an API gateway is being used across different applications for when we want to onboard either an internal team or an external team or client to consume our system. You know, the API gateway also does not provide any dependency whatsoever in a sense that uh, we don't have to 
to change anything in our services to use a gateway. We deploy it in, as a centralized ingress, uh, as a third party on its own architectural layer, if you wish. Whereas with service mesh, we have to change the existing services to be able to deploy our decentralized sidecars. And the decentralized sidecars then have to have access to our control plane. So for example, if we want to allow, if we want to allow uh, somebody to build a mobile app on top of our APIs, we cannot use a service mesh because we don't want, we cannot tell them to run a sidecar. And most importantly, we don't want their sidecar to enter and talk to our control plane. We want to have a gateway as an abstraction layer on top of our services that could, that can enforce user governance and can enforce the onboarding of, for example, a mobile app when consuming APIs in our applications. And the gateway can also be used for enabling a mesh, uh, enabling requests even within the organization to exit one mesh and perhaps enter another mesh. Of course, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm the CTO of Kong. You know, we work with the open source community uh, a lot, and our projects and products are open source. So all of this full life cycle, if you wish, service mesh and API gateway is completely abstracted away if you're using Kuma as a service mesh and if you're using Kong as the API gateway. So we're, we're trying to make all of this very simple for the users so that so that you know we, we can allow them to focus on, thing, on things that matter, which is, okay, what policies I want to enforce and how I want to expose my APIs. To recap, uh, we're transitioning uh, into a new era of software, and we've been doing that for a while now. We're transitioning from monolithic to microservices. And as we do that, we introduce more connectivity because microservices talk to each other over the network as opposed to a monolith that talks to um, different uh, aspects uh, of our uh, uh, you know, different parts of our systems uh, within the CPU. Now, of course, if we introduce more connectivity, we introduce the network. The network can be quite painful to manage and secure and control, and we want to have something that does it for us. And that something is service mesh. The service mesh, uh, really, it's a better way of managing the network. Uh, and if you wish, it's almost an evolution of our smart clients that we've been building up until now uh, when it comes to, to managing the service connectivity. And that's it for today. Thank you so much. I believe there is perhaps a small Q&A session. Yeah, yeah, we have three minutes for Q&A. Uh, uh, some people are asking, um, uh, are ser when service meshes are actually uh, relevant? And, and I would just compliment you know, uh, uh, the question by, do you need the first to have experienced microservices and when microservices is not enough to go to service mesh or can you go directly to service meshes? Uh, you can go directly to service meshes. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you something. I suggest going to service mesh first before going to microservices, because by the time we transition to microservices, if we already have service mesh in place, the network is already taken care of for us. We don't have to worry about transitioning that network management anymore. So it's one less thing to transform as part of the overall monolithic to microservices transformation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this. And so for the people who think that, I think it was someone from Netflix who said that if you think you need service mesh, you don't need service mesh because it has to be a clear mandate in a sense that it needs to be obvious, right? If it's not, uh, do you agree with that? Let's uh, see, connectivity becomes more painful the more we do it, right? Uh, and so if, if we feel like we don't have control on how the service connectivity is, is being managed, and if I am, for example, uh, an architect in an enterprise organization, and I want to take control, control back of the service connectivity that the organization is doing, then as an architect, I, I cannot uh, allow the teams to keep managing the network by themselves because it's not their job and it's not their goal. So whenever I feel like I want to control the connectivity stack, or whenever I feel like that the current implementations are causing problems and unreliability, you know, that's probably the time to start thinking about you know, abstracting away the service connectivity from the application teams. And service mesh is perfect for that because while it centralizes how I control the connectivity, it still, it centralizes the control, but it decentralizes the execution at runtime by using decentralized sidecars. So you have all the benefits of control and all the benefits of low latency thanks to the decentralized data plane model. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you very much, Marco. Uh, it was uh, with really nice slides, actually. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. And yeah, uh, so if people want to know more about service meshes, they can contact uh, Marco and his team uh, directly. Thank you. Have a good one.
Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye.